Okay, so good morning uh, and welcome to Political Liaison of March uh, 27th. Uh, we do have a number of items for this morning's meeting as we have uh, amalgamated both of our agendas from uh, last week's uh, general finance as it was rescheduled. So those items are now combined uh, with today's uh, political liaison uh, agenda. I'm going to first uh, call uh, the meeting to order and look to see if there's any um, additional items. And if not, looking to a mover and seconder to adopt our agenda of March 27th. Moved by Helen. Seconder. Second by Michelle. Oh. Oh, sorry, Helen. Were you, were you moving? That's okay. Okay. So it's moved by Helen, seconded by Michelle to adopt the agenda of March 27th. And just for the record, we did have our regrets from Councillor Nathan Wright, as well as Councillor Audrey and Melba, who are in medical. Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, we do not have any delegations or presentations for this morning's agenda, which will lead us uh, into the adoption of the political liaison minutes of March 13th. I'll move on a minute, Chief. Okay, it's moved by uh, Kiri. Is there a seconder? Second by Helen. Are there any questions or comments to the minutes? Okay, seeing or hearing none then, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Uh, we do have a couple of recommendations uh, from our CAT team. As you'll notice, the, the uh, second one is our usual monthly activity report. Um, and the first one I'll look to, it's the Global Geopark, which I know this has been here. So I see Taylor has, uh, has her camera on. Maybe I'll look to pass it over to you, Taylor, to walk us through uh, these two items. So we'll begin with recommendation 6-1. Good morning. I'll actually do it, give it to Peter for the first one because he's been working on this one. And I think uh, Bill Davis was supposed to join. Correct, Peter? That's right, Taylor. I expect uh, Phil Davis any moment. I think he was down uh, by Central trying to connect. So he's uh, going to be sitting with me. So if there's any questions uh, I can't answer, um, if uh, council wishes, we could potentially return uh, to it because I expect him imminently. Uh, so the so the first item is that geo park, which I believe was uh, first before uh, council in uh, December, uh, but there was no one to speak to it, I believe, at the time, nor was there a particular uh, resolution or briefing note. So this is a this is a attempt to have the uh, Niagara Peninsula declared as a United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO for short, uh, global geo park. Uh, it will basically not, to the best of my knowledge, uh, create any, uh, you know, legislative or, or, you know, legal additional protections uh, for the environment, uh, but it will create some, I guess you could call moral suasion, um, make, make it uh, perhaps a bit morally more difficult for, say, a developer to take out a wetland, you know, tear down trees uh, and the like. Um, Jim Davis and other supporters uh, see it as a potential uh, tourism draw uh, to the area. Uh, and Jim, in particular, uh, you know, hopes that uh, Six Nations will be able to benefit uh, from it. Um, this is generally a good thing. Uh, as I say in the briefing note, the only really uh, downside uh, that we can think of is that, you know, potentially greater tourism uh, could cause more stress on the environment. But uh, yeah, we do rec recommend uh, elected council uh, endorse the geopark. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Peter, <clears throat> for that uh, that quick uh, background to this matter. Again, Council, it's within your briefing. I'm going to look to any further questions or comments for Peter on this recommendation. And if there are no questions, comments, again, I do uh, remember this item, as Peter's mentioned uh, in early December. I see Greg has his hand raised. Uh, yeah, hi, Peter. Um, just a quick question. Is that is that within that Bill 23 lands? Is that is that in the same same area at all? Well, or do you think that'll impact? Yeah, uh, uh, on some level, Bill Bill 23, uh, you know, impacts the whole province, right? Um, but certainly a lot of the stuff associated with Bill 23, right? Uh, but not technically Bill 23, like taking out land of, of the green belt and so on. I mean, there is um, some land that is being taken out of the green belt. Again, you know, this do you for the, you know, natural, uh, for cow. I'll take your question. Will be to act that there by under correct, and if so, what is Six Nations' role in that? Yes, um, I believe you're right. Correct. Um, right, I just that it's sorry, I can't hear. Oh, sorry, sorry, Peter, your your um. Yeah, I apologize. I'm just taking this in and out so Phil okay. can, can hear what's going what's uh, going on, but I'll be sure to put it back in uh, when responding. Um, but yes, yes, you have the uh, the correct under understanding, I believe, about that. Um, but I think uh, Phil is probably a good place to talk about potential benefits to uh, Six Nations of the Geopark. Of the Geopark. So, uh, so I'm going to have to pass the headset to, to him. A, a moment, please, because they can't hear you unless you... Uh, go, scan go. Yes, the potentials that that we foresee with 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 partnering with Six Nations in the future, it, the whole part of the geopark is to raise economic opportunity through tourism. So, as we progress forward, we're still in the we're still very much in in the. Uh, groundbreaking state with the project we don't have designation we're creating partnerships with a lot of potential partners in and around niagara and of course we've been promoting our presence as haudenosaunee people going back you know uh, as far as the archaeological information goes thirteen thousand years so using the, the geographical and human habitation history of Niagara to tell the story. Niagara region is the area which we are wanting to get designated as the geo park. It's not one said small park, it's a whole region. So using all of that, everything that's happened since the ice age, uh, since it retreated, how the land was formed, when the human uh, habitation started and telling stories from there, from our part, from from any other indigenous uh, peoples that were in the area and have occupied the area at some time so using all of that to our advantage to promote tourism and of course to raise our bar of awareness which is also going to raise our political uh, issues as well on a worldwide basis uh, the global parks uh, the geo global parks are uh, there's 177 currently uh, around the world and only six of them in Canada so we're we're trying to be you know one of those first few in the game in the western hemisphere that's probably why a lot of people haven't heard or heard of them here be it but they're really big news over in the eastern half of the hemisphere they're bucket list for people to travel Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your response to that. So basically, I guess it's at, in, in the beginning stages of where we can do the collaboration with our own departments uh, like tourism uh, to really start to set that stage of what those opportunities look like. Well, I, I believe our our activities that we like to see where well, we have a meeting coming up and we're going to start talking about the trail systems that exist that we know of uh, working with Brock University. Of course, we have 
multiple uh uh we have a geographer we have a couple of geologists we have a couple of professors uh, with tourism and so we're using that uh, knowledge and that partnership to help promote and through archaeological record and of course starting research projects moving down further uh to create our stories and tell our story of that the reason the reason uh the reason that it would move so steadfastly uh, with was trying to create a partnership with Six Nations. Our, our goal was, of course, during expansion to start moving towards uh, relationships outside of the area of the geopark of Niagara region. And one of our, our topics was, of course, with, with here in Six Nations, and that's heavily why I'm involved. But because UNESCO dropped, dropped the... Uh, uh, no, was, sorry, it wasn't UNESCO. It was uh, UNDRIP that dropped the uh, uh, dropped the uh, letter down saying that they wanted to see uh, uh, unilaterally to have um, BCRs and recognition from uh, bank councils that are related to the area. Now that, now, that was a little contentious to start with because of the in, in the manner of timing that they did it and how steadfast they were trying to do it because we were trying to seek designation as of uh, last year. And that's why that's why I came forward uh, so fast because it was something that was just dropped on our desk and, and we were trying to deal with it the best way we can. You know, so our whole goal is to create the relationship so that we can uh, move forward and and just uh, just the uh, right now just an MOU recognizing the the the, the project and recognizing that we're going to start a relationship so that we can start researching how this is going to work the best for us. A lot of our work that we're doing now, of course, is tied to filling out the application involved with applying for designation from UNESCO. So creating uh, uh, partnerships, working groups, and all that stuff. Uh, actual projects, there, there's very few. We have more MOUs with partnerships than we do with working projects. I think we've we've established a couple. Tim Johnson is on our board now, too, and we've established a working relationship with Tim Johnson and, and promoting all the magnificent that work that he's done with the memorials that he's uh, made down Niagara. I don't know if anybody's ever seen those, but they're absolutely stunning, and they totally promote promote us here at Haudenosaunee Peoples, and that all has to do with the part of the War of 1812. But for the most part, that's what everybody thinks of us in our part of our history of Canada, right? They only see to 1812, they don't realize how long we've actually been around, especially in Niagara, it's very evident of where those trails are and everything. Something that I've put a lot of research into myself, just, just as a hobbyist, uh, uh, ar archeologist, geologist, trying to understand our peoples and uh, why, I, why I feel so home at Niagara as a Haudenosaunee person. So that history is, is, is very substantial and goes way beyond our part of the War of 1812. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for your response. Uh, we'll for further follow up from Michelle. Peter, has uh, Rod weighed in on this? I hear nothing. Oh, sorry, Peter. Uh, the question was uh, Has Rod weighed in on this matter? I believe Rod's online. Um, he is not, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, thanks for that. Are there any further questions or comments? Yeah, uh, Chief, I had one. Okay, sure. I'll go to Greg and then over to Sherry Lynn. Because um, um, you were saying, uh, Phil, like uh, this is kind of suddenly dropped on your desk. I hope it wasn't an afterthought on their part to not consider us, you know, at the forefront. But um, even if um, you know council goes in that direction of support, um, would be would we be considered one of the primary uh, players in all of this uh, endeavor? And also, uh, would be would be would Niagara Region promote us as well? That was just my question. Sorry, uh, Peter, you have to, uh, your mic is not working again. You're on mute. Yes, great question. Thank you. Um, 
uh, we would be promoted uh, here at Six Nations on the on the geo site, and we already have that up and running. Uh, that's, those are one of the things that we are developing as we move along, and that would go across the world. But of course, we would be developing uh, partnerships with everybody involved, especially with Niagara Region, with Six Nations, and, and telling the story of how all this is going to work and how we can create those economic opportunities uh, via Six Nations. So through we already have we already have tourism here, so tying it in with potentially from what I see, ITO to help uh, move projects forward because we all know that uh, the trails lead right up past through and skirt around this territory here. But promoting everything from the War of 1812 is also a huge part of all of that too. So there's a, there's a huge potential for anybody that wants to be a part of it. There's no, there's no limit. We don't have any say in what anybody who is a partner wants to do. All we do is maintain the parameters of uh, a designation for the geopark through no yes, UNESCO. And and so we could, you could be the biggest player as you could make out yourself to be with anybody and everybody and creating partnerships within within the geopark is highly uh, something that we highly promote. Great. Thank you. Say anything about what Greg was asking. Okay, today thanks, uh, thanks for that. As well. earlier so I just want to. Mm, yeah, I'm sorry, too. There was the other part to the question. Uh, with, with with UNESCO, yes, there's a, there always always been exclusion to include Indigenous peoples. That's why I was the third person involved with the project when we started uh, through through my friend uh, uh, Darren Plakenitz, who started the whole project in Niagara. And, and of course, there's learning curves that had to be done and are still being done. But there's always talks of okay, how do we how do we keep including Haudenosaunee peoples or any Indigenous peoples that are part of this? So. Yes, I definitely see us as Haudenosaunee and Six Nations being a, one of the biggest players involved with the park. Great, thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Phil. I just wanted to also acknowledge uh, Rod's comment in the chat that he hasn't been looped in on this matter. However, he is happy to contribute. So maybe that's also part of a possible uh, partnership, Phil, to reach out uh, with Rod on this, on this project. Uh, Sherry Lynn? Um, just a couple things. Um, uh, Phil, I'd like your thoughts on it, but also um, I think uh, for myself, I think it's a great opportunity, but I think if Six Nations supports this, I would like to see um, signage for sure everywhere that we can to make sure that people know where we did come from, where we come from, but also we're still here and to know the history the proper history, because I think this is a, um, a gateway or a start to really start um, getting it out there more than that it, is, that it is right now. So go ahead, Phil. Okay. Uh, awesome. Caught me even the flat footed here. Sorry, sorry to put you on the spot. This is the same. This is the same kind of a, a, a battle we had with uh, the Niagara Escarpment Biosphere Network, where uh, the Indigenous voice wasn't being represented, so we had to be involved with that through UNESCO, and uh, I've been doing working on that on my time to try and get our voices in there, and obviously we we have succeeded now. Tim Johnson is, is playing a key role in that. So this all fits together. I think the signage and the comments you bring up Sherry, uh, Councillor Sherry Lynn is uh, excellent because our presence has to be re-educated into this entire system. You know, certain things have happened, the, the 1812 Memorial, that's all positive. But the Niagara region, you know, the wars of 1812 all throughout this area, this area. I know the Six Nations CAP team earlier had tried to uh, um, enforce our increase of the tree canopy throughout the Niagara region. And we still want to work on that. This fits right into that mm -hmm. as well. Somehow we've got to counter what Ontario was doing for their developments in wetlands and they're just pushing ahead. So any, any allies, to my view, any allies we can find along the way, we should pursue it. So mm -hmm. those are my comments. It's all environmental uh, initiative. So, I mean, it's pretty hard to say no to this. If we can, uh, 
if our voice is properly heard and we do have a, our decision making, that's the biggest thing is that we're on this with decision making authority, not just tokenism, because that's the way the Niagara Escarpment Biosphere Network was originally set up. So we've, we've bullied our way into being in control of that now. So that that's, to me, it's all positive step and uh, it's a good initiative you're doing, I'd say. Yeah. And yeah, now, now for that, and and we already have a, uh, initiated uh, signage that we're working on with Sam Hill for the through the Fort Erie uh, 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 Friendship Center, and we're working on collaborating on getting signages done in languages, and that's part of what the trail meeting is coming up too, and that's always been a big discussion. We need to have those plaques up we need to be telling our own story we can do that on the website that'll get linked worldwide through the geo park we can link six nations and whatever it is that we want to create moving forward that will be hooked up to the to the website so people can use a scan code and, and when they're on the trails and you could hit the scan code on your phone and you'll get all this beautiful information that we can create together uh we, we will definitely be partnering to create working groups that'll that'll look at all of these different challenges that could come up for and how how we do it is totally up to and it would totally be up to six nations as a partner how you do that and uh, like i said we as the board our responsibility is to create partnerships but also to maintain our designation and what i mean by that is we're not static like like um like what uh, uh, Philip Montour just mentioned there with with the uh, escarpment, uh, we have to we have to have a long term plan and we have to uh, uh, reapply in four years. So that's what that's what keeps it alive. That's what keeps it vibrant. That's what that that the kind of like safe uh, safeguards to to ensure that the project is moving forward in the best way possible. And these are, these are old, the geo parks on the Western or on the, on the Eastern part of the Eastern hemisphere. They've, they've, they've been around for more than a few years too. Right. So they've been highly successful. And, and to me, it is very, very exciting to have this up. That's why I jumped on. I'm totally a volunteer with all of this and I've been doing it for seven years and learning an incredible amount and telling our story as Haudenosaunee people to, I know thousands of peoples and why it's important. And so, yeah, I totally agree that it's, it's a very great opportunity to raise the bar for our children, our grandchildren. Okay, thank you, now for your comments. Uh, I do see follow-up, uh, potentially question, comment from Sherry Lynn. Um, yeah, I do. Uh, thank you, Phil, for doing that. And and for sure, I guess for the part is, you know, these are our, these are our trails that our ancestors traveled. So let's give them respect and let's show the rest of the world where we, what we did and that we have been here for, for so many years, thousands of years. So I think this is um, like, again, like I said, a great opportunity, but the signage and getting it out there is, is, is key to, to show them you want to know what we haven't, <laughs> we haven't left. We're still here. Mm -hmm. So that's my thoughts. Yeah. 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 I agree. That's yeah. Lynn. Okay, I just want to also acknowledge uh, Rod's comments in the chat again that there is a national program for the designation of Indigenous protected and conserved areas, also known as the IPCAs within the Western Canada First Nations getting most of the money. So again, I think, uh, again, Phil, uh, to further uh, connect uh, with Rod, could, uh, you know, with his contributions can definitely assist, I think, in this initiative as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see. I see our relationship as being a super positive, not only for sustainability, but also, again, for the economic uh, uh, sustainability for because anybody from Six Nations, anybody indigenous from Niagara, especially women, that's highly promoted uh, uh, to increase the bar of 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 indigenous women being entrepreneurs is really pushed through by unesco and anybody that wants to create something we could all be a part of that and help you know create something that helps promote telling our stories whether it's you know somebody doing doing a walk through on the trails and sharing all the knowledge or bus tours or anything else that you can potentially think of and any of the 177 geoparks that exist if 
we go to one of them and we see something we like, we get to email them as as a as an aspiring geopark and ask us ask them how they're doing that. And they'll send us over all their data. And we've had multiple meetings with multiple different geoparks and, and informing us on how their how theirs are working. And they they've gladly sent us information on how their processes went, who they had to work through in order to make things happen. So it's it's a really it's it it's it's a win-win one all all over the place. Okay, thank you, Noah, for your, your comments as well. Looking to the floor for any additional comments or questions. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands being raised at this point, so I will look at this point for a mover in seconder to the recommendation. I'll move it, Sherry Lynn. Moved by Sherry Lynn. Is there a seconder? Second by Helen. And again, calling any further questions or comments to the motion. I do, Chief. So sure. again, he'll be working with who? Like the uh, with Peter, but also, you know, we'll we'll bring in um, Rod and everybody. Yes. So on this yes. letter too, we're gonna see if, to send them a support letter. Is that what's going on? That's right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there any further questions or comments? Okay. Seeing or hearing none, then it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. A motion to waive second reading? I'll move. Sherry Lynn. Motion, Sherry Lynn. Seconder? Seconder for second reading? Uh, Helen, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Well, really appreciate the work uh, that you're doing, Phil. And again, uh, we'll look to uh, potentially, I, I know the CAP does monthly activity reports, potentially this could be a part of that so that we can see the progress uh, happening within uh, this initiative. And again, the further uh, collaborators as well, like uh, Rod and others, even Phil, uh, got, glad to see and hear Tim uh, on as well. So again, if we can just have that regular communication and update on the progress. No, oh, yes, of course. Of course, it's very exciting to me, and I know Tim's going to be just as excited too for the potential that we can uh, build together. So, now, now go everybody. It's fantastic, Nyao, yeah, and th uh, thank you for joining us. Okay, Ona. Ona. Okay, Council, I'm going to continue moving along the agenda here. I have recommendation 6 2, which is again the monthly report for February and March of the CAP team activity. Good morning again. Uh, unless there's specific questions, I was just going to highlight. Uh, I know from last meeting there was talk about Brantford. We have set up um, what's quarterly meetings with uh, Brantford where they will be bringing um, their ongoing, starting, and upcoming projects and then explaining to us. And then uh, we can uh, express our concerns and whatnot. I do believe the next three have been set up for the year. And also uh, Kitchener and Niagara are doing similar things uh, for like uh, for the public works projects and uh, other types of uh, road, I guess, transportation projects and um, trails and uh, stuff. Um, I'm, the, the frequency of those meetings ha have not quite been set out as, as quarterly or not, but they will be um, multiple times of the year. Uh, and, then, and then they will be same kind of format. Well, they'll be presenting all the ongoing, upcoming, and the ones that are just about to start. And then, uh, and then we can comment and question them on those. I don't know if you had anything else to add, Peter. No, that was perfect, Taylor. Uh, I think those are the highlights. Uh, yeah, most of the material is, is kind of typical, uh, you know, meetings with uh, private and public uh, proponents. Uh, but, uh, you know, as far as newer stuff, uh, Taylor's flagged that already. Okay, uh, now for that, Taylor and Peter, looking to any further questions or comments from Council in relation to the activity report. Again, this is for the months of February as well as March. I'll accept the report. 
Okay, it's moved uh, by Michelle to accept uh, February, March activity report. Is there a seconder? I'll second. Seconded by Kerry. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Okay, Nyawa to uh, each of you for, for that. I'm gonna continue again, council, moving along the agenda here. Our next uh, item is recommendation from environment. Uh, which is 7-1 in relation to the FNECP um, application. So maybe I'll look to Rod uh, to give us a briefing on this recommendation. Yeah, good morning, Chief and Council. So yeah, I, I do apologize. There was a, a, br a briefing note that was uh, provided last week and it should be in the Dropbox. Um, this funding application is, um, similar to the one that we did last year for the radon gas. So it's a federal funding program uh, looking at the ecological and human health effects of exposure to environmental contaminants. So you might recall that um, there had been quite a few community concerns over, over the past few years about um, soil contamination and water contamination. So we did approach uh, Health Canada Indigenous Services and their current environmental monitoring program focuses only on uh, testing water, like a uh, well water. It did not include a, a program to access laboratory analysis of soil. So uh, myself, and I think it was uh, Laurie Davis Hill, we met with um, Indigenous Service Canada, Health Canada, the contaminants lead up in Ottawa. And they suggested in order to access some of this uh, federal funding that we put a proposal in uh, to cover some of the lab fees associated with, um, with the soil and the water testing. So that's what we did. And we received a note notation, I guess, just last week that our application was uh, conditionally or provisionally accepted. Uh, we don't anticipate that the formal letter of approval will come until probably, last year it didn't come until the, until the summertime, so hopefully it's sooner this year. But basically the premise behind it is uh, it's going to provide us with um, some funding to do um, soil and water testing and using an accredited lab to find out, I guess, um, uh, I guess we're going to try to, we, we put in the proposal to test, uh, first of all, to select up to five sites. So we know that there's no environmental regulations on, on Six Nations, as, as is the case for all of the First Nations in Canada. So the fact is that there's some legacy uh, contaminated sites or, or um, hazardous waste sites that have that people are aware of. So you recall back in the 1990s, it was Six Nations Against Pollution. More recently, we've had uh, neighborhood and citizen groups um, stopping in front of dump trucks. So there's a lot of concern. Uh, there's concern about the use of pesticides and herbicides for the many agricultural um, farms that we have across the community. So this, this project, um, we still have to, um, we're trying to figure out what we have to get in terms of ethics approval, ethics research approval. It is an internal uh, kind of environmental monitoring approach. Uh, we're not uh, looking to get an academic credit associated with this with this work. Myself and Sarah Curley-Smith um, put together the proposal. Uh, we, we managed to recruit um, a toxicologist from the University of Guelph, Dr. Leonard Ritter. Um, under this program, you do have to have a, a PhD principal investigator, so he's uh, agreed to assist with um, uh, delineating, I guess, the title of the project is uh, deline deline Delineation of Contaminated Sites uh, Across the Community. So um, there's this term called contamin contamination attenuation zone. So it's basically um, how far a contaminant, once it's in the environment, migrates. So we're going to probably be using GI GPS and other GIS-based technology to try to um, figure out which five sites we should select. We're hoping that um, we'll be able to leverage some more partnerships and some more funding once we get the work underway. Um, it's not gonna be a comprehensive uh, environmental health study as was done in the past. So you, you might recall the Eagle project um, that was in the 1990s. Uh, it was the effects on Aboriginals from the Great Lakes environment. So um, it's not that comprehensive. Uh, and then there was a follow-up with the First Nations Food and Nutrition Environmental Study. Um, so it's not, they tested water and, and took a human tissue sample as well. So we're not going to that extreme. This one is basically to say, to demonstrate that um, as a community, we know for a fact that there's contaminated uh, hotspots across the community. Um, some of these persistent chemicals probably remain in the environment. Some of them were buried. Some of them came by way of atmospheric dep deposition. So you saw the strong winds yesterday. I think it was uh, up to 
90 kilometer winds coming from the southwest. So anything coming from that part of the United States on the south side of Lake Erie could be transported atmospherically and, and end up here uh, at Six Nations. So um, there's different uh, avenues in terms of how contaminants uh, get into the, the natural environment. So we're going to assess those as well. So I mentioned we're going to do soil and water sampling at five sites and then try to figure out how far these contaminants may have migrated and then try to leverage partnerships um, and some additional funding to do more comprehensive testing. Um, I think that was it. I mean, I did try to um, put the context in the fact that we're right now we're dealing with a lot of concern around the drinking water. So the fact is that because a large proportion of the community relies on groundwater um, through private drinking water systems, wells and cisterns, um, off reserve, there'd be a source water protection uh, regime or set up to, to pre prevent land-based activities that could potentially uh, pollute a, a drinking water source. So we don't have that on, on the community. So I did have a slide that I had prepared, um, but it's it's pretty detailed. I know we don't have that much time today to get into too much of the, the details, but there's probably about, I think I listed 10 reasons why um, source water protection um, is not happening here at Six Nations in, in the context of um, land-based activities that could potentially result in contamination of, of drinking water um, in well in private wells. So we, there's a lot of talk about the boil water advisory and the drinking water advisories um, as part of that class settlement. So um, there, and there's there's reasons why uh, we have to exercise caution, I guess, and and using that drinking water without treating it. Whether it's the boil will re remove the uh, bacteriological, it won't remove the chemical contamination. So um, there's been other instances where Northern Ontario First Nations have declared a water emergency. I, I know that's a, probably a political decision to do the same thing here, but the reality is that over the, over the many decades, uh, the drinking water in private well systems is not, is not suitable for, for drinking. So again, that's a political decision. So I'll, I'll try to stay out of, out of that. But um, yeah, so uh, just to, um, again, just to, to summarize, I guess, because um, there's, there's so much in the news and the media on a daily basis. So you saw the, the train derailment in Ohio, and there was a concern about vinyl chloride getting into the drinking water system. Last week at the Environmental Task Force, we had a presentation by Environment Canada, and they'd done a, a study of um, European starlings uh, bird nests at the Bram city of Brantford landfill, and they found a contaminant um, that was quite high. Um, it's, uh, it was found in the, in the, the bird eggs. So it's called PFAS. And it's the US EPA also had a, a, a webinar last week. So the US EPA is actually de developing some strict regulations around PFAS. So they, they're, they're called the forever chemicals. It's a whole suite of chemicals. And they're everything from nonstick cookware to stain carpet removal and all that kind of stuff. So there's, there's that. And then um, just last night, there was a, you saw that there was a spill in the Delaware, Delaware River. So um, it was water-based paint solvent. And so the, the city there um, shut off the, the, the water, I guess, and, and advised people to use bottled water. Um, more, more close to Ontario or Canada was the Callowitz spill. So remember, they had the um, hydrocarbons, and so they had to shut off their water. Um, you hear everything in the news on the, the U.S. networks about Camp Lejeune, which was a North Carolina Carolina um, instance. So it's, it's, it's just basically to demonstrate that environmental contaminants are issues are coming up every day. And because we're, because there's no federal environmental regulations that apply on reserve, we're, we're kind of at a disadvantage here. in in terms of making informed decisions about um, reducing exposure to some of these environmental contaminants. Uh, so I think that was that's all I wanted to say. This there's a there's a bank council resolutions that's required uh, as part of the funding criteria for this this project, and so I've I've uh, endeavored to kind of craft a a, 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 uh, a BCR um, that we would that we would send to the funders uh, with with council's concurrence. So I'll leave it at that. Hey, Yala uh, Rod for walking us through uh, this recommendation. I see Michelle has her hand raised. So I'll move this motion, but I also, Rod, if you can tell the community, like when I first started, this is what community members were asking for is we need soil testing because we've done so much in water 
that's still an issue, but the funding is minimal. I think we need millions and this is where council plays a role. I know this is just a start, but we need to get um, obtain more money. So I'm willing to move, but if you can share to the community how much it would cost one environmental soil test to be done. Yeah, so it's, it's depending on which um, suite of parameters you want to test for. Some of them are more, more expensive, obviously, than others. So um, for instance, we did, you recall council did pass uh, a BCR last year for Peter Hill to um, to do enhanced chemical testing of wells on Six Line West, um, which he did. Uh, there was some dioxins and furans that were detected in one of the wells. Um, those tests are quite quite expensive. Uh, there's a, another comp compound or chemical compounds found in soil on Third Line, so those are called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons (PAHs). So there was benzene, pyrene. Um, detect it above provincial standards in soil that was imported to third line. And so now we're, we're trying to establish um, some testing of the wells uh, down gradient from where, where this, the contaminated soil was dumped. <laughs> so the testing is quite expensive. We had asked Peter to also test for um, a whole suite of other parameters. Um, I think they, they did most of them. Uh, we tested, I think, for PCBs and the, the, the regular ones, the heavy metals. Um, there was some, like I said, the new and emerging chemicals of concern, like these PA, um, PFAS, and then uh, some of these other ones. So the, the test varies. Um, there was some soil testing done on Six Line West, and I think uh, we worked in cooperation with Protect the Track and, and uh, uh, the Confederacy, and I think the cost for that was upwards, I think, of 25000 um, so yeah, and that was for, I think, I'll have to go back and check, but I think it was maybe five to six soil samples. So they're quite expensive. Um, we've connected with the University of Guelph Food Lab as well. So if there's um, any food products that are grown in contaminated soil um, and they have the potential to bioaccumulate and bioconcentrate in what we call country foods and farm food, farm produce, um, those tests are are not as expensive. Uh, it's a it's kind of because it's part of a routine uh, service that the University of Guelph and the Ministry of Agriculture and Food um, provides to the public in terms of giving them confidence that the food that they're eating is safe to eat. So uh, those costs um, are not as expensive. But yeah, it, it it will probably depend on once we assess um, what contaminants are in the soil. Or, or what's, what pesticides are being applied to some of the, the farms that will help us determine and select which contaminants we need to test for. Okay, now again, uh, Rod, for, for that uh, explanation, I do have a motion on the floor. It's moved by Michelle. I'm gonna call for a seconder and then further look to any additional questions or comments. Is there a seconder? I'll second it, Sherilyn. Seconded by Sherry Lynn. Um, oh, there was just, uh, Nick, uh, Chief, there was just one minor amendment. I think I did send it to Shirley at the brook. Um, the lot, therefore, be it resolved. Uh, we just said if um, the council uh, agrees with the recommendation from the task force and that um, once the funding is approved, that it would be administered um, through through I, I I had put down the environment office and health services, but I think if we just take that out, I just because of the fact that um, we're going through a little bit of the restructuring here with the Mother Earth portfolio, um, I don't think it needs to be that explicit in terms of which department or which office is going to be um, uh, managing the project. It's my for the most part, it's it's going to be myself and Sarah Curley Smith, and we're going to try to recruit uh, other department. Um, as as needed. So there was just one minor correction to the to the BCR. Okay, I, I can appreciate that uh, for the reasoning. I just want to look to the mover and seconder if that's okay with that minor adjustment to the recommendation. Yep. Okay, thanks for that, Michelle. Seconder, Sherry Lynn. Oh, sorry, Sherry Lynn, are you there? I just wanted to confirm that you're okay with the amendment to the minor change. Sorry, calling Sherry Lynn one more time. Seconder.
Sorry, I kept pushing the wrong button. Second. Okay, thanks. I uh, appreciate that. Now, uh, Sherry Lynn, and then I'll now uh, at this point go to further questions and comments. I see Hazel. Yes, uh, Rod, I would just like to ask the question with regard to the uh, contaminants that you say were imported into the res from uh, the soils that were brought in. Um, we all know that that impacts our community. So what is the plan or how do does anyone address that in terms of should the soil that was brought here that is contaminated and all, will it be uh, removed from here or what is the plan, action plan to deal with it? Yeah, so it's it's the remediation plan that is what they refer to is is going to vary case by case. So um, in the instance of third line, uh, this the, it was actually garbage that came in from the city of Vaughan. Um, it was under provincial order. There are probably about five recipient sites that received garbage um, from that property. The unfortunate thing is we don't have an environmental enforcement regime or any environmental policies that we can defer to. We have the 1993 Indian Act bylaw um, and community standards and justice department are looking at um, developing some more stringent uh, uh, kind of rules around this type of matter. But in terms of the remediation, um, council did issue a letter to the uh, CP holder uh, requesting that they respect um, the, the provincial order and remove the material that was imported um, from the development site in Vaughan, Ontario. Um, that has yet to um, take place. On six line, uh, it was a number of sources that were providing um, materials to that, to that location. Um, the property in question now is under uh, an executive, uh, it's, it's under, they got an executor, uh, land it's not land trustees or the executor any longer, it's a, it's a law firm that's dealing with that. So um, that requires, when they, when they did the initial assessment, it was going to be in the millions because the, the land trustee at the time uh, said, well, how much would it cost to remove all of this contaminants that's been dumped here? And it was in the millions. So um, the unfortunate thing is like, for instance, if you look at the city of Brantford for the Massey Ferguson Brownfields, um, they, they, what they do is they set up groundwater monitoring wells to try to determine um, how far any contaminants that were buried on site are leaching into the groundwater. And so that's how they monitor it. But they did put up a berm um, on a Mohawk road there where the Massey Ferguson foundry was. It, it, could, it could get to that extent here, but because it's just, it's, we're just at a total disadvantage here because we have no way to enforce anything of that nature because uh, off-reserve polluters pays. The, the United States EPA would set up what's called a Superfund site. And you recall the Love Canal where they put up, a, I think it was just a one kilometer radius um, area. It was highly contaminated. And what they had to do is they had to evacuate those neighborhoods, neighborhood and, and move all those people and the chemical there was dioxin. So we found dioxins in imported material here at Six Nations. You might recall in the 60s, it was Rachel Carson who sounded the alarm about the use of DDT, which is a pesticide. Um, so there's, there's no easy answer <laughs> to, your, to your question. I'm sorry, Councillor Hazel Johnson. It's just that uh, there's no resources. We have no, we have no way to force CP holders who bring in contaminated soil to clean it up. Um, other than getting kind of, we, we tried to uh, inter, get Environment Canada and Indigenous Service Canada to intervene, and and uh, but we haven't got that to that stage yet. Just further to that, Rod, is there any chance that um, Six Nations could hold, say, Vaughan, where some of that contamination came from, hold that town or whatever they are, a suburb, I guess? accountable for allowing uh, that soil to come from there and be deposited knowing they probably knew that it was already contaminated, would you think? Yes, it was a un unmonitored illegal dump site for many, many years. It, it's not actually the city of, so if you read about it, it's um, 
you can read about it online. It was a whole whole pile of lawsuits that went on and there's some of them are still going. So it was the developer that the province sued and the developer has been non-compliant and then there was some countersuits and the neighborhood got involved and and the and that's the case now is how do you tell that developer you're you're responsible so you have to come to six nations and you have to remove all that soil well he had and then in he had intermediaries so he had soil brokers that said yeah you can bring it here bring it here to six nations i got a piece of property here it's just swamp land dump it here and that's what happened and so it just, it's just like we could like I, I mentioned a few times to the task force is that uh it, you almost need kind of like uh, an environmental, like you, have, you need something like the United States Environmental Protection Agency with all their resources and all their experts. Um, and you have to have some kind of enforcement regime where you can, you can force them to clean it up. So if in the, in the cases in the United States where they, the polluter doesn't have the money, then they, they follow through with lawsuits and then the Environmental Protection Agency assumes the cleanup of it. And it can take years and, and it, millions and millions of dollars to, to clean up a site, a hazardous waste site. Good heavens. It almost sounds like there's no hope. <laughs> well, I, I think, uh, you know, what to, there's it's kind of a multi-pronged approach that we're taking and i think it's got us to michelle's earlier comments of you know we have to start somewhere i know it's not the uh, you know end all that we want to see however it's definitely the beginning of where we need to be you know heading in the direction of uh, to rod's point of you know further resourcing as well as the enforcement side of things so i think there's a number of pieces that need to align in the work that needs to align to further again the direction of where we're hitting and again i i do uh, and if rod probably agrees it's a, it's at least a start in the right direction uh, helen yeah i think it wouldn't hurt to do a really massive education campaign for our people too because really it's our people who's doing this are accepting this so I think we could try maybe do a really massive education campaign, encouraging our people not to do this, not to accept any kind of waste like that, garbage or whatever it is. And hopefully it'll get across to some people. It probably won't get across to everyone, but we have to start doing it because a lot of people in the community don't know where all these dump sites are because we don't tell people where they are. <laughs> we don't. We talk about it, but we don't tell people where they are. I don't know where this one is on sick line that's Rod's talking about, but that sounds massive. I kind of have an idea, but I don't know. Anyway, I, I, that's one thing I think we can start doing is just trying to get plead, I guess, plead to the decency of our people to start caring about the land and the and the environment because we're always hollering because we don't have no land for people to build houses while well, doing this stuff to our land is making it worse because who would want to build a house down that place that way where six light is it sounds it's like that love canal in niagara falls if y'all remember that years ago um so yeah I, that would be one of my suggestions and i think it certainly wouldn't hurt might not do much good but it certainly wouldn't hurt yeah i totally agree and i know uh, that's the uh conversation i believe as well it's a task force i'm not sure rod if you uh want to maybe make comment on on that particular uh, in terms of you know educational campaign yeah so uh yeah part of the the criteria for this funding program is uh there's you there's a whole component around risk communication. So uh, you don't want to threaten, I mean, scare people. <laughs> you don't want to scare people. Um, you, you want to be kind of diplomatic in the approach so that they, they comply with, with cleanup and, and whatnot. So the risk communication side of it is, yes, as, uh, as uh, if, you're, if you're aware that there's environmental contaminant, like, and I, have a, I took training and I have a whole uh, handbook on how to communicate risk to exposure to environmental contaminant. So, uh, and we're taking kind of uh, that approach uh, as well to, so that, you know, but in terms of the task force um, raising awareness, uh, it, 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 we did put out the interim 
um, protocol on the import of excess soil. Um, so you recall that the province of Ontario under Doug Ford paused the regulations for one year because there was so much development in the GTA and this added regulatory regime was going to add um, more time to the development of some of these sites. So he paused it for one year. So in the last year, the Ministry of the Environment and Conservation and Parks had been providing um, technical assistance to Six Nations by way of reviewing soil characterization reports. And they, they also set up uh, an enforce, not an enforcement, but an inspection uh, perimeter around the reserve to stop dump trucks coming into the, into the community. As of January 1st of this year, there's more rigor because the new regulations are now um, online. And so the interim notification protocol that we did develop through the task force, it did serve a, a good purpose, a benefit to a certain extent. It, it opened up a line of communication with CP holders or property owners that are planning to bring in what, what, is, what they've been told is clean fill. And then some of these proponents or soil brokers were so slick that they said, here, sign this piece of paper that I'm not going to accept any responsibility. And so they used a, a template that the province uses. And so then we, we got wind of it and we, we told, we suggested to the CP holders that you, you best not do that. So the interim protocol does try to raise awareness about the fact that um, you, there's, no, you, there's no safeguard to, you know, for sure that what you're agreeing to dump on your property is clean unless it's, it's got the proper approvals and it's been properly reviewed. Um, and that's, that's part of the problem, but it is, it is, uh, it has been an awareness. We have achieved some success. We have a one page um, interim pr protocol that we put in, that's a mailbox flyer. Um, and it just provides the contact information for the environment office so that we can um, increase the awareness that way. Um, but it does, I, I agree with Councillor Helen that it does require a larger uh, campaign um, just to make people aware that this is all we have left of our, our Haldeman tract. We've got this little piece of land here. There's no environmental regulations. It's open season. You can dump and spew out anything you want, burn anything you want, bury anything you want. And there's no rigor. There's no environmental assessment. We have so we're at a disadvantage, and so it's going to take all of us collectively, individually, to be diligent and to say to be, make sure what you know what we're doing. So I'll just leave, leave it at that. I know I'm getting too deep in the weeds philosophically here, but I think it's exactly the messaging that you know our community needs to hear, as well as to further you know Helen's comments. It's our it's our own members doing this, unfortunately. Helen, yeah. Oh, excuse me. Um, it's coming up to springtime. People are going to be fixing their yards and doing their flower beds and whatnot. And they're going to be bringing in soil. How do we get across to people that there's good soil and bad soil? I mean, if you're buying soil from a garden center, I wouldn't expect that to be contaminated. I would expect that to be good soil. So we can't, we can't, stop all soil from coming into our community because a lot of times it, you need it for things. It's needed to, if you're, you know, fixing your property up or, I know I'm gonna be buying soil pretty soon to do my flower garden. So I'm assuming when I get my soil from the flower place that it's clean. I wouldn't expect it to be contaminated. So we really need to, Make sure when we talk to people about soil that we're we're talking about, you know, soil coming from Vaughn, you could dump it on somebody's property would probably be contaminated because it can't get rid of it nowhere else. But I would think soil that you're buying to put on your property for landscaping or whatever is probably clean soil, I would think. But you can't test all the soil that you bring into your community. So how do, how do we do that with our community to say, it's okay for you to landscape your yard or to do whatever it is you gotta do or something like that. Like, I know, I don't know. I just know we have to differentiate between bad soil and good soil somehow. Cause there is good soil. Okay, Yale, uh, Helen, for your comments, maybe I'll just check in with Rod on any thoughts around uh, Helen's comments. 
Uh, yeah, I guess usually the red flag is if if you have a developer and and you know that hundreds, if not thousands, of dump truck loads of soil from the Caledonia development site on Empire Homes has ended up at Six Nations. Um, when I first talk, talked to one of the developers, they said, "Oh, we didn't we didn't know we had to test the soil. We had to have any permits or anything like that." Um, and so they stopped they stopped doing it for a bit, and then. They, they test it, a few of the sites, and they discover uranium and nickel. Um, so, but the thing is, it was a long time after the fact. So thousands of loads of soil from Caledonia has ended up on Six Nations. Um, they didn't isolate the part of the property there on Empire Road in Caledonia before they brought the soil. So there's no telling where it is now. So usually the red flag is if, if someone's paying you uh, to take the soil, that's a red flag. If, why won't why would why would they not follow the provincial regime and if it's clean soil um take it elsewhere i guess the, they the part of the 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 soil regula regulation is making sure that clean soil doesn't end up in the landfill too because um everybody needs soil as councillor helen points out is like you even need it for um proper grading for your tertiary septic system you need to have different grades of soil and whatnot so that's part of the awareness is if someone's offering to pay you to take the soil, that's usually a, a red flag that requires further um, assessment of where it's coming from and what potentially could be in it. And if they're asking you to sign a waiver saying they accept they accept no responsibility, that's another red flag. So I know we got a long way to go in terms of the education portion of it. Thank you for your comments, uh, Rod. I'm going to look back to the recommendation. It has been moved and seconded with that minor amendment. Uh, looking to the vote at this point in time. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. Looking to a mover in seconder to waive second reading on the previous motion for the application. Moved by Helen, seconder. I'll second, please. Seconded by Hazel, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Okay, Nyao and Rod, I think that's everything you need from our end. Thank you. Nyao. Have a great day. Okay, Council, I'm going to continue moving along here on our agenda. The next uh, under built environment is recommendations from our public works department, who we do have, I believe, our director of public works, Michael Montour, on the line. There's two recommendations, 8 1 and 8 2. I'll look to the first one for Michael to give us a briefing on this in relation to bridge number 19, uh, and then we'll get into recommendation 8 2. Uh, good morning, Michael. I'll pass the floor over to yourself. Thank you. Good morning. Council and community. Um, great to see everybody virtually and talk to everybody. Uh, Michael Mentor, Director of Public Works for Six Nations. So bridge 19, um, what happens is that uh, in the community here, we have our bridges assessed every two years um, and inspected by uh, specialist engineers. So those engineers provide a, a report and uh, basically outline those bridges that we need to look at further. Um, bridge 19, that is located between, uh, actually it's it's a boundary road bridge between us and, uh, and shared between us and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. It's located on Cougar Road between first and second line. Um, so what we've done last year is we worked together with Credit to get this, this bridge assessed. And what they've recommended is rehabilitation. Um, what we're doing now with this resolution is we are uh, going through the approval process with Indigenous Services Canada. Um, we have to uh, provide council resolutions and, and submit something called a, a minor capital application for any kind of work like this. So that part of their funding process. So um, that's what we're doing. So they've gotten one from the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, but because this is a boundary road bridge, they want one from Six Nations of the Grand River supporting the project as well. So we'll be, to, we'll be looking to move on with uh, design and get into construction as soon as we can. And of course, uh, when construction is planned, we'll be doing our best to communicate to the community uh, early and often as far as what kind of disruptions to expect. So that's the that's the uh, I guess this this resolution in a nutshell and the purpose of it. Thanks. 
Okay, now for that uh, briefing, uh, Mike, looking to open the floor for any questions or comments on this recommendation. Okay, I'm not seeing uh, or hearing any hands being raised or voices. I will then at this point look to a mover in seconder. I'll move that, Chief. Okay, it's moved by, excuse me, it's moved by Kerry, uh, looking to a seconder, seconded by Greg. And again, any final questions or comments to the motion? Okay, seeing or hearing none then, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Okay, back over to you, uh, Mike, for recommendation 8-2. Okay, so uh, this recommendation is to move some money around. So essentially, um, Indigenous Services Canada provides us with approximately $1.2 million a year to spend on, you know, priority projects and assets. Uh, we had the administration roof uh, replaced and repaired uh, this fiscal year. That project's been done. We previously allocated $300,000 of that minor capital funds to do that. Um, there are there is some money left over. So uh, I know that we're trying to connect this with a concern that's brought, been brought forward at the Jubilee Methodist Church at, located at 2728 4th Line. So uh, 